Hi. Um, I would like to continue reading from the streams to the river, river to the sea. This is chapter 12. <clears throat> when Charbonneau and Otter Woman came back, a man and a woman came with them. The man told us that his name was René Jassomet. Charbonneau told us that Jessamay was truthful and for us to believe what he was going to tell us. Jessamay spoke in Minotauri, mixed up with a language I did not understand, which might have been Assiniboine. <clears throat> I could not make out much of what he said. I did learn that many white men were paddling up the river from the town called St. Louis in boats. One of them was half as long as Black Moccasin's longhouse. Everyone held their breath until he was through his talk. Then they all talked at once and asked questions. Jessome, 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 <laughs> I'm not sure. Shrugged and said he knew nothing more. Charbonneau counted the number of white men who were on the big boat coming up the river. He held up both his hands three times, then only one hand. So he did this. So how many people? <clears throat> friends, friends, fine men's, he said. Black Moccasin had a fire built on the cliff in front of the village where it could be seen from the river. The fire was kept burning. Watchers stood beside it and watched for the men in the white in the boats. They came on the day the first wild geese flew out of the north. Watchers gave the news and all of us ran to the cliff. The big boat that Jessome had told us about was within sight. As we watched, it slowly took shape and came out of the river mist. It looked like a great floating bird with its sails spread out like silver wings. Jessome called it a keelboat. Well, we've been learning about keelboats, haven't we? Red Hawk wanted the women to stay where they were on the cliff. Black Moccasin overruled his son. He started down with a band of warriors, taking with him bags of corn and dried deer meat, and motioned to us to follow him. <clears throat> the boat was filled with white men. I had seen one of the whites, René Jossomé, but here was a crowd of them. They were young men in buffalo leather and with hairy faces. What skin you could see was dark from the sun. They looked something like minotauries, except for one of them who seemed to be a leader. At least he talked a lot and the rest of them listened. This one had blue eyes and hair as bright as copper. Our chieftain welcomed him to the village of Metaharta. He pointed to himself and said, Black Moccasin. The man with the red hair smiled and bowed. Clark, he said, pointing to himself. Then he pointed to a man beside him and said, Captain Lewis. <clears throat> this man bowed, but he did not smile. It was the other one I liked, the man with the hair that shone like copper. He must have liked me too. He kept glancing at me while he talked to a man who was translating what he said, a man whose name was Druyer. Afterward, Captain Clark came to where I stood on the bank and gave me four blue beads, not black ones or yellow or red, but blue. They were the same color as the sky on the clearest day, the same color as his eyes. I was so surprised that I could not smile or speak. I just stood and held the four beads in my hand. I looked at them, then at him, hearing my heart beat hard. He gave out presents for everyone, a shiny medal for Black Moccasin, a twist of tobacco for his son, and for the village of Metaharta, a thing that stood up corn while you stood just looking at it. Instead of pounding and pounding kernels on a stone, you put a whole corn, a thing that ground up corn, I'm sorry, a thing that ground up corn while you stood just looking at it. Instead of pounding and pounding kernels on a stone, you put a whole corn cob in a big kettle and turned a wheel round and round and cornmeal came out the bottom. All the women cheered when they saw it. The next day, the two captains came to the lodge. <clears throat> they sat down at the fire and took off their moccasins, which meant that they had become friends. Then Black Moccasin put a bearskin around each of them 
and they all smoked a pipe. They passed it from one to the other around the circle. Now they were friends forever. The two men came back that night and brought some of their friends. One had a fiddle and they danced in front of the fire. They stamped their feet, kicked up their heels and flew around in circles. Everyone enjoyed this so much that the men danced till dawn and promised to come back the next night and dance again. This time they brought a black man with them. His name was Ben York, which was easy to say. I thought that he had painted himself black. When he was not looking, I wet a finger and rubbed his arm. No black came off. The children tried rubbing his skin too. They pestered him until he made a face and showed his teeth and said he was a monster and would eat them alive. He spoke no Minotauri or Shoshone, and I spoke not even a word of the white man's language. But with Druyer's help, I learned that Ben York's mother and father were black, that he was born black, and had been black every day since. This man is Captain Clark's servant, Druyer <coughs> said. He's a slave. <coughs> Excuse me. Where he comes from in America, there are many slaves, black ones like him. The black man saw that we were talking about him. He pushed a flock of women away and came over to where we stood. He was tall, taller than Charbonneau, and very graceful as he walked, taking long strides and swinging his arms. York, he pointed to himself and held up his hand with the palm out in the sign of greeting, like that. Sakagawea, I said, pointing to myself. <clears throat> Druye explained that my name meant bird woman. York laughed. Do you fly like a bird? He asked. No, I fly like a bat. When? At night when everyone sleeps? I said. York shook his head, half believing me, and the women who had been waiting to get close rushed in and surrounded him. They were still not sure that he was really black. They did know that he was very handsome. They had never seen anyone like Ben York. That night, when there was a big dance, the women held their breath as he jumped about and clicked his heels. The dance lasted until the sun came up. Then Captain Lewis fired his air gun. The gun was on wheels and made of shiny brass. He pumped on the handle and suddenly it made a swishing noise and a bullet struck a tree with a loud bang. Still, no one wanted to leave. They were so happy. Captain Clark had to call George Drouillet. Drouillet had blue eyes and long hair streaked white by the sun. He was very tall, straight like a lodgepole and had long dangling arms and big hands. He was half Shawnee, and he spoke a few words in Sioux, Minotauri, and Mandan. But he also spoke in the sign language that everyone, everywhere, in all the tribes knew. When Captain Clark called him out, he came forward and pointed to the eastern sky. Menaka, he said, which is the Mandan word for sun. Then he raised his arms and made signs, and everybody took the hint and left. And that was the end of chapter 12.